digging into, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, how much. Uh, dig into those, you know, where did it run? How did it run? Who was it targeted up against? Uh, you know, what was the format? What, you know, h- how long did it run for? What was, you know, what was the next action that, that the user took, especially with something digital like that? Really the who, what, where, when, why, how much? Dig into all those questions and usually you can find a gold nugget and you're like, wait a minute, that audience does not align with that media plan. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Okay. Hold a newspaper or magazine or other reading material right up to your face. I mean, touching your nose close, way too close. What do you read? Nothing. It's a blur, right? It's just all a blur. Now hold that same newspaper, magazine, book, whatever, at a comfortable distance. Everything comes into focus, doesn't it? This is a perfect analogy for a challenge many marketers face. When it comes to an audience at arm's length, namely our current and potential customers, that audience at arm's length, we are practiced at using our communication skills to help them understand the perceived value of our products and overcome any possible anxiety. But the group of people we are closest to, the ones in the very same walls as us, so to speak, our colleagues, we can overlook the necessity of understanding their possible anxieties, the non-monetary costs they face, and help them understand the process level value proposition for actions they need to take. We can be so focused on doing the thing, we overlook communicating why others in our company and in our partners should join us in getting it done. Or as our next guest puts it, change agents need broad support. Here to tell the story behind that lesson, along with many more lesson-filled stories, is Christina Martin, the Executive Director of Marketing for Chase Auto at J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Thanks for joining us, Christina. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Let's take a quick look at uh, your background. I'm just going to cherry-pick a bit off your LinkedIn. You were Vice President of Global Digital Marketing for MoneyGram International, Vice President of Digital Marketing for Goldman Sachs Personal Financial Management, Executive Director of Lending Marketing for Mortgage and Consumer Loans at USAA Bank. And for the past year, you've been Executive Director of Marketing for Chase Auto. So very focused in a specific industry. We're going to learn a lot about that industry. But based on the stories that I've read from you, uh, we're going to learn a lot. No matter what you're marketing for, B2B, B2C, Christina is going to have a good lesson for you. Uh, So right now, you manage a team of six engaged in B2C marketing for Chase Auto. And I'm sure you've heard the brand we all have. Uh, but I was surprised when I actually looked it up for myself and saw some of the numbers. J.P. Morgan Chase has $3.7 trillion in assets and $292 billion in stockholders' equity as of December 31st, 2022. And one out of every two households in America has a relationship with Chase. That is a big brand. Uh, so what is your day like as Executive Director of Marketing for Chase Auto, Christina? It is very exciting. Actually, I am relatively new. I just joined in Q4 of last year. So if you send me an email and tell me it's my responsibility, I'm probably going to fall for it because I'm still learning this job and figuring out who are you and what do you do. Um, I still ha- have get amazed when I get an email and it says Jamie Diamond in my email. I kind of have to pinch myself a little bit. I tell everyone when I went to work for a chase, I said, I've never played minor league baseball, but I kind of know the feeling of getting called up to the big league leagues. Uh, After I got the uh, offer from Chase, I walked into my husband's office and I said, honey, we're going to the show. So uh, (laughs) to have a to have a long career in financial services marketing to finally um, walk through the doors at JP Morgan Chase um, has just been an amazing experience. And it's every day is still learning. So I really can't tell you what every day looks like. But it's just it's been a lot of fun so far. Well, you know, I hope 10, 20 years in, when uh, you and Jamie are just having lunch, you'll also take that approach. Every day is still learning because that's some of the, That's a great approach that a lot of marketers have taken that we've interviewed. And I think, and looking at your career, I think you have taken that approach. So let's take a look at some of the lessons from your career. Uh, as I mentioned, I've never been a podiatrist or an auditor or something else, but I feel like there's something special about marketing that we get to make things. You know, we get to make brands, we get to make campaigns. Uh, so let's look at some of the lessons from the things you made. Your first lesson, this grabbed me right away when I read your application. Don't fall for wild e coyote marketing. 
So what do you mean by that, Christina? It, so for those of you who don't know who Wiley Coyote is, so he is a cartoon character. So Wiley Coyote is a coyote. And um, he was forever in a quest to get dinner. And I'll explain about that a little bit more, but just a backstory on who Wile E. Coyote was. So as I mentioned, I recently left USAA um, to join J.P. Morgan Chase here as, at Chase Auto. Most of my career has been in established companies um, with recent roles at USAA and Chase, and those, those brands are over 100 years old. Uh, like most new roles, the onboarding process kind of starts with discovery, you know, the history lessons, asking a lot of questions, asking more questions. What's the strategy? Can I read your PowerPoint deck? What are your tactics? Look, can you show me your dashboard? How are things doing? Historical performance. Uh, really both w what's working and what's not uh, in that discovery process. But then, um, you know, you pivot to the point, well, you know, why'd they hire me? I better get to work here. Uh, but before we get to Wiley Coyote Marketing, one uh, lesson that I kind of want to work in here, it's kind of around that, is really kind of finding your marketing North Star. Uh, I have learned after some career false starts, we shall call them, I like to build marketing things. I like to build new campaigns. I like to build programs. I like to hire teams. I say I'm a marketing engineer. If that was a thing, I would, I would be a marketing engineer. So during the job hunt process, literally the first question when I take a phone call from a recruiter, the hiring manager, HR person, whoever it is, I ask them these words. It's quote, I say, is this a run the railroad job or a build the railroad job? Uh, I specifically look for roles that are going to be building that railroad. I want new marketing roles in companies, uh, new com new companies, uh, recruiting you know, new positions, marketing new product lines, marketing opportunities in, in companies that are undergoing some sort of process transformation or industry transformation. So one piece of advice that I give marketers early in their career is really to experience the diversity of the marketing discipline. Uh, I recommend seeking out like rotational programs. Uh, agency work early in your career is great because you can work with a broad range of clients and industries. Or skills-based volunteering is also another way to, to explore or different parts of marketing. Uh, and as a hiring manager, you know, always be open to letting your junior employees shadow other roles and encourage finding mentorships for them to get to other areas of marketing. Um, but really, my question and my lesson is back to Mr. Coyote, Mr. Wiley Coyote. So my first, this career lesson is look out for Wiley Coyote. Wiley Coyote is the person in the company uh, who has the history of an idea of what, how it was attempted once and it didn't succeed and then not, and then totally abandoned. He discouraged, he, she discourages any attempt at optimization, iteration, it, iteration, trying it again. Um, so, you know, if you think about Wiley Coyote, if Wiley Coyote would have done a postmortem on his, on his journey, he would have, you know, he, he rode a rocket in pursuit of the roadrunner, which he wanted to have as his dinner, which the roadrunner is a bird for those of you who don't know. Uh, and it usually resulted in him hitting the side of the mountain instead of catching the roadrunner. So if Wiley would have done that po postmortem and said, buying that acne rocket with a steering wheel, uh, I could have steered and avoided that, uh, side of the mountain, uh, I would have been able to catch that roadrunner and had the juicy meal of a roadrunner. So uh, really kind of the mantra of, you know, we tried that. I've heard it in every new company I've ever gone to. Um, you know, insert marketing tactic here and what miss KPI, you know, branded paid search doesn't work. Original long form content doesn't work. Video doesn't drive traffic. I mean, good. Okay. Well, why? Let's dig into it a little bit. So that's really kind of the, the case of the, the why I say avoid that Wiley Coyote, especially when you're starting a new job. Yeah. And so I think there's a good essential question to ask there when that comes up, and maybe you have a few other questions that, that you've asked in your career, is, well, tell me the process for how you learned that. Uh, because, for example, I've, you know, I've come across this before as, uh, you know, one thing we do is these value proposition workshops, and we meet with different companies, and we talk about their tactics and value propositions. And so one example, we were working with a security company, and they had this ad that was, like, very entertaining with this very comical burglar going in a house and, you know, I was really questioning, like, ah, is that the right message? You know, so, I mean, think about it. A comical burglar going in your house, what, what really happens when you're thinking of, of purchasing uh, a security system? It's, oh, you know, two doors down, someone broke into that house, and three doors down, someone broke into the house, and I'm going out of town next week, and I'm worried about my family. And so they're like, well, we tested it. We know it works. We tested it. 
And so I was going to stop there, to your point. That was the Wiley Coyote. They already knew. But then I, I thought, and I asked that extra question, like, okay, well, tell me about your test. And I found out it was a focus group test. So it makes sense then, right? Because people are sitting at a mall, whatever, they're getting paid, they're watching this. Well, it's entertaining. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I like this. Versus actually being in the buyer's shoes and having that fear and anxiety and not wanting some joke, wanting to know my, my family is really going to be protected. So give me a sense, like, what are some good questions that you've asked to pull out of people to get them to answer that, you know, correctly so you can understand, okay, is this something they've really learned? Did they really do that postmortem? Or that they just, you know, they didn't really kind of get the right lesson out of this. Absolutely. And d digging into, you know, the who, what, where, when, why, how much. Uh, dig into those, you know, where did it run? How did it run? Who was it targeted up against? Uh, you know, what was the format? What, you know, how long did it run for? What was, you know, what was the next action that, that the user took, especially with something digital like that? Really the who, what, where, when, why, how much? Dig into all those questions. And usually you can find a golden nugget and you're like, wait a minute, that audience does not align with that media plan. Are you sure that that was a good, well, that's what, you know, so-and-so said we should be doing. So it's digging into those and making sure that you have alignment throughout that, you know, they say integrated marketing, in the integrated campaigns. Make sure that all of those decision points are aligning up. And then, you know, you would have found out that, yeah, they were sitting behind the glass watching a focus group. Sure, people are going to giggle. But if you look at the performance of the asset, it may have been, well, this guy was an absolute dog. No one was clicking on it. You know, the video compl completion rates were terrible. Um, so, you know, dig into those and uh, make sure you understand, have a good foundation about, about the campaign. Yeah. And this also brings up, I wonder if you have any advice on the entrenched consultant, right? So you go into a uh, new organization. A lot of times there's a whole ecosystem of agencies and consultants and kind of you have to find out which ones are really delivering and which ones are just kind of that entrenched consultant. Because because one thing you mentioned Wiley Coyote, Mark, and the other thing I think of Wiley Coyote, that guy was brand loyal, right? <laughs> Acme, <laughs> Acme might have never paid off for him, but he was brand loyal. He tried the next Acme product the next time just to see if it worked. And you know, there's I mean, especially tech products, this is true. But in marketing, too, there's, there's consultants or agencies. If they've got those long relationships. They're entrenched there. And then you're looking at the actual track record, and you're like, where does, where does this come from? So, uh, so what's your experience with that? How do you deal with finding you know, those vendors and those consultants and making sure they're right for the company when you're coming in? Absolutely. If you are the cash cow for the agency, um, that's probably a little bit of a red flag for you. And if they are always recommending one product from the Acme product line, not the Anvil, um, which is all, is my personal favorite for catching roadrunners in the desert, the Anvil, um, then I, that's definitely something that that you need to look at. And you're exactly right. Just a lot of times there's you know agencies that just you know come in and get a good foothold and you know get a little bit complacent. And I think you kind of need to you know turn up turn up the volume a little bit on these on these teams and just make sure that you're getting the best work and you're do and making sure that you're having the cadence of the you know the QBR the quarterly business review the MBR the monthly business review and you're running through and you're having that cadence and that opportunity and that ceremony to ask those deep dive questions to make sure that you're not running in, into any wily coyotes on the on the agency side I like that. And that you're running the business, not letting someone else run the business for you. Absolutely. Right? Not letting a vendor run your business. Absolutely. Especially in the, sh the area of strategy. You should always, never outsource your strategy. Let's take a look at uh, another lesson you mentioned. Change agents need broad support. So I mentioned this briefly in the beginning. I feel like sometimes we communicate most poorly to the ones closest to us internally. We forget we have to do that. Uh, so how did you learn this lesson, Christina? <sighs> Well, uh, this was a quite painful career lesson, but it is a career highlight. So there is a hap there is you know a bright spot at the end. So I was recruited to a new company, and I was specifically recruited for my industry and my product marketing experience. My charter in this new role was really to reimagine the marketing function for this specific product line. Uh, within this company, this specific product was in a re coming out of a retrench strategy. Uh, they were retooling back office process, um, had some compliance issues. 
and the product was actually out of market for a while. So my role um, as communicated during the recruitment pr process was to reimagine the go-to marketing strategy and the tactics to return to marketing. So as a marketing engineer, as I call myself, you know, what a dream. Oh my gosh. Yep. Sign me up. I'll pay you to go work here. This sounds fantastic. So after the job discovery, uh, I decided to make a strategic recommendation to implement agile, the agile methodology within marketing. And so, um, you know, did a white paper, wrote it all up. Uh, the existing waterfall process that this company had was really too rigid, too long, and just not very responsive. A key function of this product, the driver was uh, rate and being able to message near real-time rate movements. So being agile and operating with agility was really essential for success. Um, uh, the company, the marketing was a centralized function. Uh, and, you know, companies have different op models for how they operate marketing. Is marketing in the center? Is it in the line of business? Um, you know, so this company, it was, it was centralized. And the teams were aligned by line of business to the specific product. So this new agile model that I was recommending would shift the marketing support closer to the line of business. So more input from the line of business would be happening on marketing. So, you know, if you're familiar with agile, you know, the epic and the stories would you know, be a joint collaboration coming together with the product line. Uh, prior to prioritization ceremonies, the business would be sitting in on those. And on the Agile team, there's a role called product owner. So the product owner would be coming from the business, which was in the line of business reporting structure and not marketing. So the And this recommendation also called for some new roles that didn't exist. So a digital channel manager and a scrum master on the Agile team. So I was, you know wagging my tail all ready to get in there and get, get some things done and recommending all this change. Um, and I was a change agent, right? Well, uh, the, you know, the business was all in. They were ready to go. We're going to be faster. We're going to be agile. This is great. Well, yours truly uh, terribly underestimated just the amount of socialization and the debate that would be needed to get everyone on board to do this, especially in the marketing team, because I was just throwing a lot of change at this team. I assumed that everyone was on board on the same page in, tr in terms of change. I understood. I thought that everyone understood my charter, like, hey, this is why this person was hired to come in and do this. And I didn't do, uh, didn't do a good job level setting that, especially adjusting that model um, and the level of business from the line of from the line of business marketing team really underestimated uh, what it was going to take to bring that amount of change into that organization so I want to ask you about communicating that change or kind of digging out the right way to go about that change but first I want to ask you about agile specifically because you mentioned two books maybe you can share a lesson from each of these books that really stuck with you you mentioned Scott Brinker's hacking marketing and Jeff Sutherland's Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. So, you know, Agile methodology, I think it probably maybe started more on the, the tech side when we talk about Waterfall and Agile software development, right? But then it's spread and it's spread into marketing as well. So I wonder if you have any, any thoughts or any lessons that you learned from these two books that you mentioned that when we're talking about Agile specifically, you know, other people listening can use as they're trying to use that methodology to manage their marketing. Absolutely. The first one, Scott Brinker's book, Hacking Marketing, is really kind of the blueprint for how to apply, as you mentioned, because Agile started within kind of the tech space, the software development space. So marketing is, is different than that, right? Well, Scott went and kind of did all the heavy lifting and the big thinking for us and said, okay, you know, it's different. Here's how we need to apply it to marketing. So his book is really more of a blueprint for any team who is interested in, in trying uh, the Agile methodology within the marketing function. And then Jeff Sutherland's book. He's the godfather, father, I don't know exactly what, what he says, he, what they say he is, but he is the uh, person who birthed um, Scrum. And so his book is honestly um, probably like a two-hour read, but his book is just really about kind of ha the how and the why of Agile and just highlights the roles and why you want to follow it and why you want to do it. Not so much decked up against marketing, that would be Scott Brinker's book, but his is just in general. And it's, a, it's just a really good, easy business read. I, I enjoy both those books. I, I wish that I would have been uh, in front of this and been able to author something like Hacking Marketing because I just, and I recommend it to everybody. I love that book. Well, he wrote it for you, so we don't have to. But we've got this podcast episode where we can share what, what you've learned as well. Uh, so let me ask you more broadly now, though, not just uh, Agile in general. Has this experience changed 
how you enter an organization, how you're new, go, come in new to an organization, or how you even enter a project, right? Because coming in, like as I mentioned, a lot of times uh, we're so focused on communicating externally to our customers, we overlook the fact that there are the, some of the same things within our organization, right? We need to understand that audience, that is an audience, that is, I mean, they're our internal customers in a sense. We need to understand what potential costs they might face. Tends not to be monetary, but it might be budget, but it could be things like friction, anxiety. And we also need to understand what is the value proposition to them to do these actions. So you could say, well, yes, maybe I have command and control authority. You know, in a certain sense, I have this team reporting to me, you go do, you go do, you go do. But as we know, that only gets you so far. What's really effective is understanding the costs and understanding the value to a group and communicating to them. That is what we do as marketers, right? But we struggle internally. So I wonder, has this changed how you go into an organization or how you approach a project, how you learn about the people there? Absolutely. And it's not just the what, but it's the why. And you've mentioned this on some some of your other podcast episodes. I think just, you know, communicating to the teams why we're doing something. Here's the reason. Here's the here's the SWOT analysis um, that, you know, that somebody that we went through, that somebody went through, but here is the why. I think that is one of the biggest takeaways um, from that story and and just from some other marketing um, marketing. Exper- experiments and things like that that I've that I've done is communicating, um, you know why why we're going to do this, not just the what and you know the how and the when are important as well, but communicating that why and having those level those level set sessions and I learned this phrase I think it's a military phrase but bluff bottom line up front I learned that in my USAA days but just you know really thinking about you know what is the what is the bluff of this project what is it that we're trying to do the objective the mission. And and laying all that out for the team and having a very, you know, a very broad stakeholder session, sessions within the discovery process so that everyone understands and bringing them along. And if you can help people understand the pain or the opportunity a little bit more and help help them to see why it's their mission as well um, goes a long way. And the, you know, the story that I, that I told it actually, it ended up, it ended up great, actually. The Agile team, we did stand up the Agile team and the product got back into market. But the best thing was this company has 400 plus members of the marketing organization and they are now all operating in Agile because of the work that this this first team did. So uh, like I said, it was painful, but it, it is definitely a career highlight for me. Very nice. So it comes down to, in one sense, storytelling, like you said, let them see why this is their mission too. This isn't my mission. I'm thrusting on you. Why it's their mission too. So let's talk about storytelling. I love the things we've talked about already because you know in marketing we need those really good creative ideas, but we also need to execute. And up until now, Christine has given some good advice on how to execute and actually get things done. I got to admit, my background's on the creative side, so I always kind of skew towards these. Though uh, you say great brands consistently tell their story. So yes, this is a lesson I'm sure we would learn in marketing 101. But how have you lived this in your career? Absolutely. So when I did work at USA, that was a great lesson in branding and storytelling. Just a brand and a company that invests so much time and resources and just the rigor and the process around protecting the brand um, and understanding what the re- what reputation risk looks like. So it was just, it was a fantastic opportunity. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I do guest lecture uh, occasionally at my alma mater, University of Central Florida, Go Knights, uh, in the marketing department. Last year, I did a presentation to an EMBA class on brand. And so we actually walk through, you know, real world examples out in the wild from USA, the brand, the brand material. So we did a little dissection. So we went through the brand and the mission, uh, securing the financial security for the military community. Uh, still remember it. Uh, we're still, and everything resonated very strongly in all of the marketing communications that we fa- found, both, you know, member and employee facing materials. Um, in the lecture portion, you know, we, you know, we're view the, the things that the, the, the teacher, the professor could test on. We went through the branding models, branded house, house of brands, hybrid approach, um, and the individual elements of the brand identity, the mission, the values, the personality, the brand pillars, brand promise, all those good things. But really, we also got into using storytelling. And when I was an undergrad and in, in graduate school, we didn't really talk a lot about storytelling in marketing. And so, you know, I definitely wanted to make sure that I mentioned that in this in this 
this class and we walk through Gustav Freytags, who I'm probably pronouncing all kinds of wrong because it's German. Um, his f storytelling framework, which is the five arc pyramid, which was really interesting. So then I had the, the class go through and pull real world examples of companies and have them walk through and map their brand story in that five act pyramid. And, and everyone, you know, had pulled really great examples and you could clearly see how they were doing it. Uh, it was just, it was a fascinating approach. Well, what advice would you give to someone who works at a very large organization like yourself, where you are trying to tell a story, you're trying to drive your division, and yet you live under the umbrella of that bigger brand? So as we talked about, I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase, one in two households, $3.7 trillion in assets. That is amazing because you've got that brand to leverage. On the flip side, you know, how do you do disruptive marketing, disruptive creative, tell your own story where you kind of have to be under that big umbrella? I see you rolling your eyes. So what, what have you learned kind of doing this? <laughs> Absolutely. So one project um, at USAA really comes to mind. So it was developing a campaign for a new product specific in the home loan area. The opportunity was around the VA home loan product. Um, we had been just messaging, general mortgage messaging, but this was specific to the VA, the VA loan product. So we needed all new creative just to message a VA loan. Okay, not a problem. Team can do that. Then uh, we got another edict. So there was a new brand architecture. So I'm sure you've probably, if you watch sports, especially USAA, um, the new, the campaign was the, the made for was the big idea. So now we had to align underneath the made for big idea. Okay, two hurdles, we can get get around that. Then the third hurdle came in where the requirement came down that all new creatives should support the DE&I objectives of the company. So that's really where we, we the team and the agency got to work because we really had, we had our, we had a pretty, pretty, pretty daunting product project in front of us. So the team really rose to the challenge. We had to incorporate again. We had to incorporate that master brand work at the product level, which hadn't been done. We had, to, of course, stay on brand. We had to demonstrate DE&I and communicate USAA's value in delivering the product. So the team started by first determining that with that VA loan product and the military segment, which was targeted for that VA loan product, there was really a unique opportunity to focus on the inclusion pillar of DE&I. And so what we wanted to do was show some inclusion and some representation from wounded warriors. So the creative brief called for specifically casting a military veteran with a prosthesis to, sh to, ha to have that inclusion in the ad, in the visual of the ad. And we included that requirement in the storyboard. Um, we had to show that actor in a very authentic real world situation. We wanted to really show inclusion in the, in the everyday life. So the brief also specified that the spot should incorporate storytelling. So how we use storytelling, we wanted to demonstrate the challenge of our hero, and I use hero in air quotes, of finding a home and navigating the confusing lending process. So how, and then we finally, the final spot was a real world scenario of online house hunting um, and then depicted moving day with, and we ended up the, um, the veteran that we cast was, it was a male. So he kind of played the dad role. So it was he, he and his service dog and all of the family was participating in the, you know, the final move in day, the culmination of the house hunting and getting the loan and all that great stuff. And so, uh, we, we did the spot. It was called, um, USA made for the military home buyer. So we checked that box. We leaned into the master brand idea and, and the specific to the VA loan product, check that box. And, um, I'm very proud to say, but it was the first USA bank campaign to cast a differently abled actor. And we told our story of our hero with the help of USAA. Um, he was using their family's earned VA benefit to find a home and celebrate that move in day. Well, first of all, I mean, I can't move on without saying that's a very powerful story, like tapping into that story. Um, but I want to mention, too, like, I think there's a great lesson here. So a lot of times I hear from, you know, marketers at smaller brands, they're jealous of the big brands, right? Oh, my gosh, they've got that brand recognition. They've got that giant budget. But the big brands, like you said, we've got all these hoops we've got to jump through, right? And the big brands sometimes are jealous of the people who work in the smaller brands, the startups. It's like, oh, my gosh, you can, you know, you've got a white space. You can do whatever you want. And I think the lesson is, and you tell me what you think is, is wherever you are working, you have got to find your advantage, right? What is your advantage and tap into there? And so in your case too, when we're talking about creativity, creativity thrives under these sorts of restrictions, right? We would think it would thrive just with total 
white space, you could do anything. Like, yeah, you know what? Any Anyone could do that. Any college student can do that. But if you are a professional marketer, right? If you put on your professional marketing pants every day or your professional marketing suit and you go to work and you get that paycheck and you work for that brand, it is the ability to work through that primary value proposition and all those restrictions to focus on your customer and then to find that value proposition like you did that ties into and checks all the boxes and is still creative and serves that person. So that's that's my thought. Is that... Does that seem Absolutely. to resonate with? Yes, very, very much so. You know, you think as a as a big brand and you look at startups and like, wait, you can put your logo on black? We can't put our logo on black. This is going to make it so hard. But again, that's where you have to get creative and you have to figure out, okay, well, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to fade to white here and then I'm going to show the logo and it's going to be on white. I'm going to fall within my, you know, my branding guidelines. I'm not going to mess that up. So absolutely. Um, and it's, you know, interesting to see kind of the evolution of brand. You think about USA, a hundred year old brand, and then they, you know, kind of pivoted and came up with a new master brand architecture, which was, which was amazing to be a part of. And it, it's, it's been really successful and I'm very, very proud of that spot. Are, are those the commercials with Rob Gronkowski, the former uh, Patriots dead end? Yes, that's part of that's part of them. Yeah, I like those. Uh, all right, in the first half of the podcast, we talk about lessons we learned from the things we made, even when they were difficult to make because we had so many brand restrictions. In the second half of the podcast, we talk about lessons from the people that we collaborated with. Uh, but first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. To learn how MechLab services can help you get better business results from deeper customer understanding, visit mechlabs.com slash results. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S dot com slash results. Okay, let's talk about some lessons you learned from the people you collaborated with. The first lesson is stay close to the wellhead. And you learned this from Ray Gary, the head of sales and marketing for EDS Retail Petroleum Unit. How did you learn this from Ray? This career anecdote was really told to me during my very first job out of undergrad, again, UCF Go Knights, um, in the early 90s time frame. So I was working at a software company that served the oil and gas industry, specifically retail petroleum. The company was based in Orlando, Florida, and it was acquired by EDS. And Ray was part of the transition team that came down from Dallas, Texas to integrate and run the acquisition. Uh, the marketing role in this was my you know my first job out of college, green grad, heavy sales support, sales enablement, all B two B. So developing product collateral, creating client proposals, pitch materials, managing a calendar of trade shows. I got to go to fun shows like the National Association of Convenience Stores, which was amazing. Um, and then after the uh, acquisition, I was given the opportunity to relocate to Dallas to get you know air quote corporate experience and get exposure to more types of marketing. So I was getting, you know, packing up my stuff, getting ready to go to headquarters, moved to, you know, the big D um, to work for EDS. I was going to take up a brand role, more of a brand role, move away from sales support. So I'm packing all my stuff up and Ray comes into my, you know, my cube and says these words to me, he says, stay close to the whale head. And he was from an oil company in Oklahoma. So I had a very, very specific accent when he said it, which I will never forget. Um, so in the petroleum business, the wellhead, you know, just as it sounds, it's, you know, it's the beginning of where the oil comes out of the ground. Obviously, Ray meant this as, you know, he was the head of both sales and marketing was to not lose sight of how the firm makes money. Stay close to where the oil comes out of the ground um, and don't stray far from doing the work um, to support really the service, the sources of your revenue in your firm. And I'm not one to uh, to get a tattoo. I'm kind of beyond that in, in my life. But if I was, I really honestly think I would get stay close to the wellhead because it's 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 been a good one for me. So I would think to make that work, flexibility is important. You mentioned that kind of briefly just in the opening, even volunteer at nonprofits do all these things to stay flexible, to get all these experiences. I wonder if you had any you know, specific experience or specific example of how you had to be flexible to stay close to the wellhead to that revenue. And I'll give you a quick example from a previous episode. I interviewed uh, Jeannie Asimos, the head of content and communications at Way.com on how I made it in marketing. And someone that really inspired her in her career was uh, the CEO of eHarmony. And she talked about one of her lessons was adaptability is important. And he started uh, as an intern in a broom closet. And he just kept saying yes to every opportunity he got until he made his way to CEO. So I wonder for you, you know, you mentioned in the beginning 
importance of flexibility. I even mentioned, hey, volunteer to a nonprofit if you have to. Staying close to the wellhead, it seems like, well, you got to be pretty flexible and you got to zig and zag, especially as quickly as some companies and industries are moving these days. So do you have any specific anecdote or experience about kind of keeping that flexibility within your career? I, I do. And also, you know, if you have, if you take roles, as I mentioned, like if you, you know, early in your career, if you take a role with an agency, that's a great way to get some exposure to the different types of marketing. So specifically when I worked at EDS, uh, when I went to corporate, I then got away from oil and gas uh, as fast as I could, but I won't hold that against them. Um, so I went to work um, for EDS, started up an interactive and new media group. So this was like circa 1995. Um, and EDS was developing a uh, web presences for many brands and it was their first website. Like I worked on the first pepsi.com website, um, which if you go into the Wayback machine is hilarious to look at how terrible it is, but it was, it was a great project. Um, brand sites for different Procter and Gamble brands we stood up. Um, but really the, the things that stood out in my career was the early e-commerce sites. And I figured out that I could kind of marry my love of this new thing called digital and still staying close to the wellhead by aligning, you know, with these e- e-commerce sites as they were called back then. Um, so those experiences in digital, I have leaned into those and really tapped into creating a career focused around the digital marketing capabilities um, and staying close to the wellhead, focusing on the sales channels for digital uh, in the e-commerce and revenue side of the business, and then programs that help support the revenue. Okay, let's take a look at uh, an other lesson. Uh, you mentioned observation is a powerful research technique. You learned this from Dr. Frank Bass. Uh, he was your marketing professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. So how did you learn this from Dr. Bass? Good old Dr. Bass. Dr. Bass is called the father of marketing science. He passed away in 2006, and so I had to look it up. That was in his obituary. Pretty good. You know, as, as somebody who has a whole career has been in marketing, I, you know, I'd like to be the, the mother of some, something in marketing. I'll have to figure out what that is. Um, so after I moved to Dallas and I had a little bit of work experience, I decided to pursue an MBA. And right in my backyard at the University of Texas at Dallas, UTD, was Dr. Bass. Uh, his most famous work is the Bass model, and it's covered in, you know, undergraduate marketing curriculum. And I remembered it when I was researching MBA programs. I was like, this is amazing. This school's in my backyard. So I took every single class that Dr. Bass taught. It didn't matter. I took master's degree. I took PhD level classes. If that man had an office hour, I was going to be there. You know, just the opportunity to learn directly from him was amazing. Um, it was in the late 90s, and Dr. Bass was toward the end of his career, and true to, like, the Texas typecast, um, he was a native Texan, and he could tell a really fantastic story. He just made lecture days awesome. So this career lesson really originated during a lecture about how he, how he did, you know, came up with the Bass model. The model, um, if you have don't have your marketing textbook handy and can't look it up, it was created in 1966, and he was trying to predict demand for this new thing in 1966 called color television. So this model looks to predict the number of new adopters over time in two cohorts, both innovators and imitators. Uh, according to the story that he told, uh, his family was from Cuero, Texas, and they were in agriculture. He was observing how modern farming equipment would be adopted by certain farmers, he noticed that like one or two farmers, ranchers would try something new and they would be the innovators in his model. And then they would be it, the, whatever they were doing would be adopted by the other farmers and it was the imitators. And he was really drawn to like the consumer behavior of product adoption. But then he took it one step further and he applied math to the problem to be able to predict specific behavioral patterns. Um, he, Dr. Bass is supposed to have, he's been said to have been, and I'm quoting this, pivotal in established marketing as a quantitative science. I just, I love that. I think that's, that's absolutely fantastic. And just, you know, the career lesson for me in marketing is the heart of the BAS model, just observation is just one of the best research methods. Uh, watch, you know, listen to your customers. You've talked about this before on, on your podcast, you know, use the words that they use. How are they using their product? Um, you know, what are they talking about? I'm a big fan of all sorts of marketing thought leaders. And um, there's 
one group that I follow and they have a saying called Nahito, nothing important happens in the office. And that just absolutely rings so true. Like just get out in the trenches, you know, sit behind the research glass, watch how people are using the product, listen to customer service calls, tag along with the sales team to see how, you know, to see how the, the targets are interacting and what kinds of words they're using to sell the stuff, not the stuff that's written in the marketing collateral. Just really get out there and, and kick the tires, if you will, and um, observation can really tell you a lot as a marketer. Yeah, do you have any examples maybe of when you or the company thought a specific thing and then you took that observational approach and, and it was like, oh, wow, you know, we, we observed in this way and we learned this thing. I mean, we've interviewed, I mean, just in the financial world, I've interviewed uh, all sorts of uh, marketers and some of them, one of my favorite was a marketer who would actually, they were, she was trying to reach unbanked customers and she would actually go outside the Western unions and, and some of those type of competitors. And she would talk to them. She had a clipboard and she would talk to them because they were, they were difficult to measure. They weren't getting them through digital channels. They weren't getting them through other channels. And she actually just went out there and talked to them. And it was you know, kind of amazingly refreshing what she could learn from them. So do you have an example of how you observed and, and maybe what you learned, something surprising? Absolutely. It's actually with, within that same space, within the underbanked and non-banked. And it's for a company called MoneyGram. Um, Western Union is the number one and MoneyGram is the number two, the kid brother in the money transfer industry. And so my team was part of a new group called MoneyGram Online. So we were tasked with launching the online money transfer function around the globe. Uh, the team was new. The functionality really only existed out of the U.S. And as a global leader, Western Union, they were already in a dozen countries. So we were rushing to catch up as fast as we could. So we decided to use a rapid prototype approach to roll out this digital transfer service. So the team was based in the U.S. that was doing all the development work, but we would tap into the local marketing teams in country really to help uh, help us understand the specific marketing segment for each, for each country. So we would do a prototype and then we would go to the country and we would test it in language to make sure that the product was usable. So really focused on, you know, not having any large usability errors when we were first launching. So one one. Uh, project was we were sitting in Germany watching a usability test. And the whole reason, you know, this test was memorable. Well, just beside the fact that it was in German, I was sitting in Germany, little kid from Orlando, Florida, sitting in Germany watching a usability test. A key diaspora of that German money transfer market uh, is the foreign workers from Turkey. So this is the people who come to Germany to work and send money home back to family in Turkey. So we were sitting in Germany watching an audience of users from Turkey use the prototype and talk through the experience. Uh, but a key learning of the segments is that these folks that come over from Turkey quickly learn German and they think of German as their primary language, not Turkish. So they were much more inclined to select the little button at the top of the prototype for which language they were going to select German because that's, that's what what they were more comfortable with when they were coming to their new country. So again, we were sitting in Germany, you know, watching native Turks now living in Germany, conduct online money transfer, speaking in German. Uh, and another wrinkle was none of us spoke German. So in our sessions, we're sitting there listening to German being interpreted into English, but still just everything that we learned, watching them interact with that prototype. How did they click on things? What words were they using? Where did they expect to see things? It gave us great insights when we decided, when we did build it out and finally launch in that market to, you know, it was really market tested with minimal usability issues, just fueling the adoption for that, that functionality globally. Yeah, that's a great, great benefit of observation. I mean, we've talked about it many times. We're not our customers, right? There's this challenge we always try to be like, treat others how we want to be treated. Treat others how they want to be treated. Observe them to understand them, and you can better serve them. Uh, let's, one last lesson here, uh, and I love it. It's from your dad. So one last lesson. A problem isn't a problem if it can be solved with money. Uh, by the way, that could be Chase's tagline, by the way. You might want to consider that just to... Uh... <laughs> TM, TM, Christina Martin and Daniel. We, 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 we came up with it. I'll rev share with you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, anyway, a problem isn't a problem if it can be solved with money. You learned this from your dad, Big Tom Bordenaro. Uh, Bordenaro how did you yep. learn this from? Bordenaro. Right, Bordenaro. How did yep. you learn this from your dad? 
So I just can't have a life or career lesson discussion without giving a little airtime to my dad. Um, I don't have kids and I can't pass his parental wisdom along, but I'll do it for your, to your listeners. Uh, but I do have many um, college friends who knew Big Tom, and uh, as we call him, and this was one of the stories that they use with their kids that are coming of age. And I also incorporate this in lessons. I participate in the mentor programs with both UTD and UCF's mentoring programs. So we all affectionately call these life lessons Big Tom and um, and as a mentor, I really strive to help these students kind of transition to the working world, getting, you know, just starting off on a good financial foot with good financial habits. We have discussions about, you know, the financial decisions that come up when you start your career and how to, you know, make the right decisions when you're first starting. And this lesson is pretty bold, you know, and it, it financial security can alleviate a lot of life's problems. And these green grads are like, wait, wait, what? What are you talking about? How do I do this? I don't want any problems in life. I just got out of four years ago college. So we uh, we st- really start there and just getting them off on a good foot. I talk to them about credit scores, what they are, how, you know, how to get it, how to keep your credit score. I also give different financial tips and tricks. I advocate, you know, paying yourself first with automated savings programs. Um, I I offer to help them set up their 401k program with their first check because I want them to, again, pay themselves first. So we kind of walk through that. I talk about emergency funds, how to participate in your company-sponsored retirement program. I know for most of them, it just seems like so far off this, you know, ladies sitting here making me sign up for my 401k when I want all my money, when I want to go buy all my avocado toast, but I make them do it anyway. And so, you know, matching dollars, things like that. So really getting the most out of, out of their pay check uh, as they can for the future. So I'm, I'm pretty sure Big Tom would have been proud, would be proud. Have you ever applied that lesson to your marketing budget? Because I think there's a great lesson here too for, I mean, this is definitely for startups who have to learn how to manage money, make sure they manage that VC funding right, get cash flow right. Uh, but even, you know, marketers at, at big organizations, like there's always got to be that contingency. Like we set the right plans. <laughs> we think they're going to work out the right way. But if we don't have that contingency in place, uh, it might blow up in our face. So a problem isn't a problem if we can solve with money. If we have that money sitting in our marketing budget to solve that problem, it sure becomes a lot easier. So have you, have you used this at all in terms of how, obviously you manage your personal finances, but how you manage your marketing budget as well? Absolutely. And I think a lot of that also goes to writing really good business cases. So in your, you know, your initial, your initial request for funding, you know, hold a little bit back, you know, this is the contingency that we're going to build into this, whether it's, you know, this channel works really, really well, and we want to be able to throw more, more gas on it. Uh, So building in a contingency is, is important when you're coming up with those initial plans. But also if you build very solid business cases when you're first launching something, if it's successful, and you need to come back and ask for more money, if you have a good track record of writing solid business cases, it really helps. That's that's a, probably another, you know, fourth life lesson that I would throw in there is, you know, partner with people and write really good business cases. Because when the higher ups know that you have thought through everything ahead of time, uh, you, when you come around for the, for the second, for round two, round three, it goes a lot easier. You're not just coming hat in hand. I like that. Absolutely. Uh, well, so we've we've talked about all different things about what it means to be a marketer, from good storytelling to writing good business cases to the change management we talked about. If you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? What are you looking for? What are you going to be in your career? What are you looking for when you hire? Curiosity. Uh, I look for somebody who's just really curious, wants to know how things work. How does this work? What does this do? Who's this for? You know, somebody who just asks the who, what, where, when, why, how much, those questions. Uh, that's that's something that I really look for and I try to screen for. Somebody just who, who has a natural curiosity for how things work. You know, as a kid, did they take things apart and then try to put them back together again? That's, um, that, that's always a, a good anecdote. If somebody tells you about that, you know, definitely put their resume on the top of, on the top of the pile. Well, thanks for letting us take your career apart and put it back together. And I learned a lot from you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A dot com.